beyond that, I'll, I'll also just remind that, that this best, this learning gathering is uh, in spirit, uh, very literal, works in progress, uh, a way to add, ask some, some questions, share some challenges, um, share some unfinished thoughts, uh, and yeah, uh, share works in progress. Um, to get a bit of a check-in with the community of practice on both how your work is resonating as well as um you know what what are the what are the questions that we should be asking ourselves and and how do we help each other become uh, even more ambitious and bold uh, when it comes to trying to uh, transition into uh, i guess what is a new paradigm of of public governance uh, i think you could sort of certainly say that based on the the last three days that we've what we've heard um I also wanted to just also say thank you to our partners, uh, Citra Lab, for making this possible with us, uh, and not least also the State of Change fellows and partners, um, including the, the Danish Design Center that's, that's been very kind for a number of years now to uh, uh, provide host here in Copenhagen for State of Change. Uh, so, so very much appreciate it. Um, and also for the, all the fellows that's been, been, been contributing all throughout the, these three days. Uh, so thank you uh, very much uh, to all of you. Um, and then for the for today's topics, um, I mean, we were struggling with the title. That that's an honest uh, reflection. Um, our mission is the answer to everything. Uh, was sort of um, based on some of the some of the let's call it more of a hype uh, that that is around missions these days. Uh, seeing it everywhere, everyone wants to do it. Every it seems to be the answer to every evolution when, when we are talking about how governments and institutions should be operating. Um, so it's sort of provocative, but it's also maybe it, it is actually the the answer. Um, we're here to find out uh, from Daria from uh, Binova, obviously leading uh, great work in Sweden, and Christian here in Denmark leading great work with the Danish Design Center, both of which um, are applying mission-based approaches. Um, so I'm really looking forward to to hearing how that's going, uh, but also to explore the institutional implications uh, of such an approach. Um, so, and, and the, here I think we will be drawing in uh, sort of experiences of what we heard throughout the three days. Uh, so, so looking forward to this conversation. Um, and the way we, we kick it off is by uh, Christian and Daria getting a, a bit of a chance to just uh, introduce themselves and their work and some of their thinking. And, and frankly, what the current thought is, um, and then uh, we can jump into the discussion from there. Uh, and uh, Kristen have volunteered to go first, so so uh, I'll give it over to you, Kristen. Thank you for, for being here. Thank you very much, Jesper, and uh, pleasure to be here. And uh, and we are very happy to to host States of Change. And I'm also myself a, a proud a proud fellow. Uh, and uh, I see a lot of uh, of familiar names as well in the um, uh, in in the room now. Uh, so, so let me just spend about five minutes on uh, on giving a take on on uh, on uh, missions and and maybe I'm not trying to answer the question, but but reflect on it certainly. Um, first of all, we should of course remind ourselves that that uh, the idea of mission oriented innovation is is not so new uh, anymore. Uh, uh, Mariana Mazzucato framed it, uh, uh, I think, about uh, maybe a, about a decade ago, at least in terms of the entrepreneurial state and the role of the state in driving um, addressing grand challenges. I recall in my my first book uh, in English on public sector innovation from 20, 2010, there's a small uh, section on uh, uh, the following question. Uh, could we innovate uh, by starting with outcomes, uh, with long-term uh, ambitious outcomes, and then go backwards from there and then open up new spaces for innovation? Uh, and so uh, and so, so that was also a consideration uh, for, for me uh, a while ago. Now, I think what's interesting, as you say, yes, but with the hype is that now this is becoming, if not a mainstream, then at least a, a very um, widespread approach. I think uh, as by last count we've been involved in, there's about 600 institutions and individuals around the world uh, looking to missions as an approach. So it's really uh, becoming front and center. In terms of our work at the Danish Design Center, I wanted to share a little bit about how we, how we view it as a case example and, and then uh, then we can maybe dive into the conversation uh, later in this in this session uh, on implications now first and foremost for us i think it's a question of of um, being aware of um, selecting problems that are worth solving 
And in a world full of problems uh, and, and, and governments being quite oriented towards problems, I think missions help us become a bit more uh, articulate and precise around what do we want to solve for us. Uh, it's important uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, we look at uh, the green transition and uh, digital uh, transformation, and we look very much on social innovation. And uh, across all those um, transition areas, you could say, uh, there are many, many problems that you could solve. So which ones do we choose to look at? And when we look at them, we look at them from the perspective of uh, uh, facilitating new innovations and opening up new markets. So that's both government uh, and, and business. Um, and of course, when we do it, we also look uh, to it because we want to uh, uh, demonstrate the power of design and to expand uh, how we might uh, use the uh, tools and methods and mindsets in design to really accelerate uh, sustainable growth. Um, so that's that's how we looked at it. And, and then uh, you can say our overall arching approach, which, which we've also shared in a, in a new playbook online, is very simple. It's basically about uh, how do you set uh, a common direction? How do you um, mobilize an ecosystem uh, around a, a problem domain? And how do you finally build the capacity uh, to actually bridge uh, the future you want to create with the ability to get there uh, starting today? The journey that we've been on uh, can be illustrated, I think, by, by one case example from, uh, from the green transition, where we look very much on, on circular economy. And we've chosen circular economy and circular transition as a domain. And one of the first issues for us in terms of, you know, is what, how do we frame the mission? And what we said was we want to uh, uh, create an irresistible circle of society and making that the vision that we want to create a society that's worth living in, that's actually really attractive, it's aesthetic, it's meaningful, it's something we want to be part of. Uh, and that needs to be the driver uh, in terms of, of, uh, of uh, how to um, achieve the transition to a more sustainable world. Um, we then, I think, worked hard on finding um, setting the frames for the context. So setting the context frame for mission, I think is important. And uh, in doing so, we've, uh, for example, looked very much on, uh, you know, uh, how do we create uh, more systemic uh, business models? How do we get um, uh, public private actors to collaborate in a systemic way? How do we look at behavioral design? And of course, how do we also look at, at, uh, at industrial design and in, 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 uh, designing for disassembly, for example? Um, so I think it's all about identifying the opportunities and the scalability uh, in, in, in running uh, a mission like that. In terms of learnings, I wanted to, to just start sharing that some of the learnings that are, are emerging already after I've worked on this uh, green and circular mission for about a, uh, about a year, uh, um, year and a half maybe. Uh, one is uh, patience and iteration. Now to really uh, remember the long run and, and really look at how do you iterate around uh, creating a movement and creating, uh, mobilizing the ecosystem. It's about trusting a process uh, and, and really working in that kind of opportunity space that the mission itself can generate. It's about working in new ways uh, and also really understanding how to inspire people to want to be part of something. Um, it's about building learning mechanisms and processes of learning and uh, finding new ways to collect data across a, a portfolio of activities, especially because uh, we need to look at, and we realize that, of course, to look at other organizations' projects, not just our own. So when you look at a portfolio of change projects, it's all about no, no matter whether you're a funding agency or you're an uh, innovation actor like us, to, to, to look broadly across uh, all of the, the whole portfolio of activities that could benefit, benefit the mission rather than just what you're in control of. Um, which I think calls for the, um, um, the last point I'll end with in my first starting point here, which is I think we need to think very much about building a new kind of institutional infrastructure for missions that are, let's put it this way, in a third place. So it is not, so it's, so it's collab collaboratively owned, which means um, uh, going together a group of actors and building something uh, apart that you all can take a responsibility for together in terms of, uh, let's call it a, a, a joint governance uh, model, a, a, a joint uh, mission management model. I'm beginning to call that next-gen labs, um, next-generation innovation labs that really have to take this sort of systemic approach to underpinning and supporting the pursuit of common missions. I think that's enough from uh, for me to start with. Uh, I'll, I'll hand on over the serve to you, Daya, and look forward to the conversation. Thanks, uh, Christian. Thank over to you, Daya. Uh, well, that was fantastic. And you said so many things that I'd just love to, to dive into. Um, 
But uh, yeah, let me just start with this. So I'm really, really happy to uh, be invited here. Uh, I didn't have the opportunity to listen of the previous discussions, so this is my chance to listen and, and learn from you guys. Uh, I'm coming into this discussion, however, with uh, the impressions I took with me coming from COP26. Um, and, and there, um, the, my strongest impression was that finally, uh, the wind has really turned. Um, there is this really broad awareness. We know that the hard deadlines we're facing now, <laughs> they're set by the planet. It doesn't care about how much we're willing to invest or what we're capable of in terms of innovation. We need to adapt. Uh, and I think that the pandemic also has opened up the space for that in many ways. While it's been this really concrete, urgent and, and painful challenge for society, it has really forced uh, prioritizations, changes in prioritizations, changes in, in ways of working, uh, not least on the individual level, so that we have right now a point in time where we have a shared global experience that reminds us that change is not only necessary, it's actually also possible. So I just have that really in my mind that I think that this is, a, is an essential thing in the, in the days that we are living through right now. And then understanding then that we know to, to be able to make this transformation happen, we, we, we have knowledge gaps, we need innovation, we need demand side interventions, we need radically improved citizen engagement, we need investments at scale, and then at the same time, those investments are actually uh, available now, again, because of the pandemic. So one crucial question is, uh, are we uh, capable of making sure that these investments are made wisely into the future, or are they actually being poured into uh, restarting old business models and the ways of working that, that we know we shouldn't uh, have anymore. So I think that all of this comes back to why uh, do we need missions? Why should we not allow it ever to become a buzzword, <laughs> uh, but actually put all our effort in, in uh, showing and learning how to make it happen? So we know that the speed of the transformation completely depends on the effectiveness of the interplay between technological business innovation, demand side interventions, investments in infrastructure policy that creates opportunities. Um, so this is why the missions cannot only be giving us the directionality and the enthusiasm, it also actively needs to shape uh, our work practices. And I think Christian made some really important points on what we what we need to do. So at Vinova, we've spent, first we have since a decade, the strategic innovation programs that gives a lot of national credibility to the value of mobilizing actors, public and private across industries with shared strategic agendas. So the outcomes of these have been uh, I would say too incremental, <laughs> uh, too uh, focused on technology, but nonetheless, it has created you know, a, a shared experience on the national level of the value of, of uh, having shared, strategy, uh, shared strategies, agendas, and, and working together. So that's good. And then at the same time, uh, I think that with this awareness that now um, transformation to a sustainable society is what drives also competitiveness. So we have come to the point where we have a true commitment from industry as well to actually put uh, their money and priorities on driving this. And there are some very, very interesting examples of that I would like to mention. So we have that. We have since a few years been running uh, pilot missions uh, practices, for instance, within mobility and food. Uh, We've had some nice progress there, uh, a lot of appreciation. I'm hopeful that, for instance, within food, we can now see it's a different type of mindset, it's a different discussion, not least in the family of funding and, and the, the agencies with, with policy responsibilities in this space. It's a completely different uh, capability for uh, in, uh, in companies as well to, to. So we're at the point where I'm hoping that that will materialize in a, in a real mobilization around mission, ambitious missions uh, pretty soon. And then another thing that happened is that when it comes to connecting and coordinating missions at the EU level, I think we've been learning a lot from uh, the area of climate neutral and smart cities, because again, coming back to the National Strategic Innovation Program, we have one called Viable Cities. We used that as a platform and then connected it to the EU mission level where in a rather short time, this has managed to drive a mobilization in terms of, for instance, there's a climate contract in place signed by four government agencies and nine cities uh, committing to ambitious targets, committing to you know, help each other out, sharing experiences, also failures, <laughs> uh, 
um, and at the same time connecting it to the EU mission level. Um, and just uh, last and and just last week, uh, the Swedish government at the same time with a a bit on the sidelines initiated um, finally the investigation of should, could we have regulatory sandboxes as a formal uh, policy tool, uh, which I think would be a perfect tool in a missions platform because it will be a controlled platform it will not get out of hand we know the experiments we know the actors and we can we can actively push that so that's a, a bit of a hopeful development um the last thing i'd like to say is and and that's uh, amazing to see of course this is not about one government agency or the the ecosystem that we are you know pulling together it's it's really uh, a shared leadership so right now what's happening in sweden is that we have many industrial leaders they are ma making big investments into driving the transformation in fossil free steel which is a large part of our fossil emissions um, and while they do that they actually actively drive uh, new value chains that are circular uh, because they come into the the cycles of phosphor they come into you know a lot of the hydrogen part they connect uh, therefore to the mobility transformation so that is happening uh, and then coming back to the policy change then, what it means to people on the ground. Uh, I grew up in northern Sweden, loads of trees, great northern lights, not that many people. <laughs> um, this industry-led transformation initiative has already started attracting investments, but it has more importantly changed the conversation. So people, be it the local political leadership or the people living in these cities, they have a new mindset. They talk differently about themselves, about their opportunities, about their capabilities, about their goals. So what is emerging is a shared you know, idea of a new future. And I think that's an important, very important message to political leaders everywhere, that once you get this mobilization around these goals and you get started, it creates a lot of hope, actually. Um, so the key question for me, uh, obviously, again, also in that example, you run into policy problems. <laughs> for this, you will need, uh, I don't know, dig the big cable connecting the new windmills for all the new effect you need into, etc. And those processes are too slow when they are not facilitated with a better quality, when they are not including uh, the citizen perspective in time, etc. Uh, so it just comes back to why we need uh, also the work processes and practices that are embedded in this type of uh, missions work. Uh, so that's just coming back to Christian's talk. So a key question for me uh, right now would be effectively, you know, how what we're very busy talking about, thinking about and trying out is how do we in practice uh, build the capabilities we need in that type of coordination efforts. Uh, and I'm really eager to listen and learn more about that. But yes, the mindset has changed. The opportunities are there. And uh, the practical work is the challenge and is the task right now. Thank you, Daria. And, and, and just for that somewhat hopeful uh, account, I think. And so so let me, let me turn that question right back to Christian uh, around capabilities uh, and that sort of practical nature of it. Uh, to the extent that you have been either thinking about or planning for how to, to embrace that. Uh, you mentioned the capacity element uh, as part of your approach. How, you know, what are what are ways to actually integrate that? Because, uh, you know, it, I guess it's a sort of fairly new uh, thing for at least most organizations just to think about capacity as in, sort of embedded into, you know, um, doing shared projects, uh, doing, Taking people uh, on a journey and so on. So, um, so, so, um, so, what do you think there, Christian? Uh, any thoughts there? Well, just uh, realizing all the great uh, comments as well coming out of the um, yeah uh, the chat here, and I think they're they're, they're really uh, really powerful. Um, uh, I, I certainly think that that as we go forward, I think there's a lot of experimentation going on with missions, and I think uh, I think the, there's some great work been done at, at at Venova as a pioneer. We see, of course, work emerging from the IIPP, and again, as I mentioned, I mean now the experimentations are happening around the world. 
but I think there's a, a need to um, to begin to um, shift to more the institutional setup. So I, th I very much like the sandboxing example, um, remembering that uh, regulation still matters uh, as we experiment hands-on and locations and so on to, to really work on the on the on the more hidden aspects of, of what does it take to drive drive the change. Interestingly, I was just hearing some Danish uh, actors the other day uh, highlight. Uh, the sustainable steel uh, uh, manufacturing in Sweden. So, so as a as a really positive example of what's happening now. So, I think in a way we need to begin to build it, that kind of operating system of, of 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 missions to say what are the, the the things that need to be in place, and and I think ultimately this is about uh, governing uh, long term transitions. And because we know long term transitions have to take place across uh, uh, multiple systems, multiple levels. And across uh, quite a lot of complexity, I think we simply need to build um, a new kind of institutional infrastructure. That doesn't mean that an organization, for example, like uh, Vinova, wouldn't play an incredibly instrumental role. Uh, but probably Vinova as an institution, or to not compare too much, but the Danish Design Center institution, we would have to play a particular role together with a set of actors in building that infrastructure. What's your, what's your take on that, Daria? What sort of role would you? Are you seeing Vinova playing in creating that infrastructure that's so important for this? I mean, uh, Vinova is. Uh, <laughs> I, I think if we look at it's it's. I think it's good to look at what kind of capabilities are needed and now what kind of uh, organization uh, builds. You know, contributes what is different in different contexts. It depends on you know how the government organizes things or or whatever where you have it. So. For me, it's more uh, it's more interesting to to ask the question: What capabilities are needed? Uh, because I think that we will never organize ourselves out of this, regardless. <laughs> and then, in what capacity can we help build it? Will be you know different. So, Vinova can, for instance, if I compare it to the Danish uh, Design Center, we probably have uh, fewer. Uh, you know, we do have it, but not as much of the design capability. But we have uh, funding, <laughs> so we can yeah, money. support others. <laughs> But we also have design capabilities. So yes. it, it's like, so the interesting question is, you know, what are the capabilities? And what we are seeing also it, is that other capabilities are also absolutely essential. I'll give you another example. So you have one city in Sweden, I'm not going to mention one, but it's it's heavily oil dependent because of its industry, right? So you have partnerships with multinational companies like Prem owned by Saudi. If you want to change that, it digs straight into city planning because it's, it's going to be infrastructural dependencies, right? It's going to take decades. The chain, the difference between having a planned scenario of change, facing that out and changing it in a partnership compared to doing something like this, where you lose out on these partners, is huge. It has huge implications for the city, huge implications for budgets, you know, balance sheets, etc. However, if you want to address that, you need risk assessment. Uh, capabilities. And then you need really, really skilled uh, negotiation capabilities as well. So I think that what we're seeing is that as we dig into more and more um, ambitious transformation plans, we learn about new capabilities that we also need. Um, I, I like that perspective very much. Um, and, and I think it's, um, as you said, uh, first of all, you know, be aware, what does an organization bring to a mission? Mm. And as you mentioned, you, you bring both strategic design, you bring funding. What you may not be able to bring on your own is, uh, is regulation uh, or, or high level policy. So, so, so finding that role and then saying, OK, then we need to get in these and these agencies or these and these departments and in government. We need to bring in business and so on. I think building those alliances and that capability, as you say, in, in, in well, there's negotiation. Yes, there's also risk sharing, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also a lot of, um, of uh, visioning and strategic uh, you say, communications. Uh, we, we ran a, a workshop yesterday on on this uh, on uh, on this toolkit that we've developed on missions, and also discussed you know the, the longer term perspectives. And as one person said, from from a, uh, a finance side, it was actually you know direction is everything. You know if you don't align around a common direction, then exactly. everything else doesn't really matter. So so maybe you know there's a huge communications and envisioning exercise in, in making the future tangible. Um, uh, somebody asked about a. Uh, if at what level do we build missions? And I think, as, as you also said, Daya, missions can be very, very different, right? I mean, in Denmark, we have a mission, uh, a research mission on power to X technology. Uh, some can even discuss, is that really a mission? Uh, it's, it's a technology, but of course, it's also a future market. It's also transition in, in a lot of industries. 
um, uh, you've worked with the future of, uh, of, of food, perhaps, or, or, the, or the street, uh, which is a, 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 a very systemic change, but at an entirely different human scale. So I think we need to recognize this multitude of ways in which you can address it, but, but, but there may be some methodologies and approaches that are shareable. And so, so I don't think one size fits all, but there may be something that is in common. And, and I think uh, what we are lacking right now, in my mind, is really the learning infrastructure. Maybe, maybe states of change is one place for that to happen, um, but also at, an, at a national level, how do you build a learning infrastructure to really help actors learn quickly? Because for many of the missions, you know, uh, there's a sense of uh, urgency uh, time is running out and we can't afford to not learn. Uh, mm -hmm. We can spend 10 years experimenting and, uh, and, and, and uh, don't get it right then uh, we're in all in trouble. So, so I think um, there's, there's a, in terms of capability, there's a call, I think, to, for, for a very, very intelligent, accelerated learning. And I believe very strongly that uh, also actors like Venova, uh, funding actors, could actually take on that responsibility because you have such incredible access to the ecosystems. Mm, because absolutely. when you have money, everybody go, comes to yeah. you. No, it's true. And I think another capacity, I mean, obviously, it's not, we're not just a funder, we are also an, an agent in the system, because everybody is, you can't be in the system and not, you know, not influence it. Uh, and we have, uh, and that's what, why I mentioned the strategic innovation program, such as Viable Cities, is actually uh, a platform that, that enables a lot of learning. Um, and then it's interesting to see these types of tools. So if we talk about the regulatory sandboxes as a tool, another one is uh, different types of procurement mechanisms. Uh, a third one is the contract. You know, if you start combining those things, like if we know that we can see the experiments, we can see the solutions, if we have contracts where everybody commits, you know, yes, we will implement our procurement tool when we see something that works, that kind of, you know, that type of... Uh, toolkits can really help accelerate uh, things. I think, um, so I, I agree and I, I absolutely feel that a, a, an agency like Renova is a, we have a, we are in a good position to provide those platforms and also be part of them, of course, but we're just, we're one, hopefully valuable piece in the puzzle. Can I, can I just uh, pick up on, on, on those uh, points and also uh, kind of echoing a, a couple of the questions in the chat. Um, so the, there is a question around um, what these collaborative spaces or models look like um, uh, and maybe expanding on, on that uh, given you talked about different roles uh, but Christian you also mentioned that you, you know this idea of a sort of a third space third, that is shared and where there's shared ownership uh, and I think that that sounds about right uh, you know also given what we heard the last couple of, of days and in, in these calls particularly when we are dealing with a transition that is both democratic political and bureaucratic at the same time so so you know how you know who's who's owning this who's driving these who gets the mandate uh, and how do we deliberate around that um, and i'm not going to allow you to just say well we just have to involve the users and then we'll figure it out like there must be a, a like a sort of a, a a tighter answer to what that space actually what constitutes that space um and um and um uh, and and how do we enable those actors to, to kind of really take take ownership of that? Um, and, and sort of as, as a footnote to that, there's been a sort of a wide echoing of, um, uh, well, a right critique of the, the current ability in government, in international institutions to actually, you know, deliver the sort of funding mechanisms that are, that are right for this, that are, you know, providing the learning mechanisms and culture that's right for this, um, and that that is it, frankly also kind of very far from kind of having any kind of R and D capacity uh, that are, that are needed and, and right for this. So so you know so I understand why it has to kind of go go outside of government or outside the institutions to some extent. But then yeah, what is what is that alternative? Right. So I can maybe just give an example because. Working with one of our partners, we suggested to build sort of a, let's call it a, a hub, which would be a, a shared space where, let's say, uh, six or seven actors would go together across funding agency, uh, policy actors, uh, innovation actors, and, and sort of have a core uh, group that would say, well, we would take a shared ownership and shared risk in establishing the third place, which would be the hub. And the hub would actually be an, an active mission a portfolio uh, like a placeholder, not something big, not necessarily bricks and mortar, but something where you say we simply need a, a resource that could, on behalf of all of us, 
uh, ensure, uh, let's call it emission execution. Um, and then you would, what you want to build is a, a governance model where there's a, a, a democratic or, or institutionalized uh, set of decision-making processes, uh, managing the risk, but also managing uh, the joint motives that people have for joining. And then you want to expand the ecosystem. I think you would want to create a, this kind of third place would need then to reach out. And I think the big issue with missions is that you would want to start with some actors, and then over time, some would spin out, some would spin in. You would have uh, businesses, of course, spinning in and out, but you also would have uh, research institutions, you would have societal actors, you may have policy actors. So this very dynamic, agile, uh, but also very long-term and strategic approach would be the, the job to be done for this kind of, of hub. Uh, you could also call it a secretariat of a few people. But I think we need to build these hybrid institutions that, that are boundary spanning, because we, we're not going to solve those kinds of problems that missions are addressing in silos. Uh, neither uh, necessarily national ones, but certainly not uh, sectoral silos. Uh, yeah, also, I'll just uh, run with that a bit. So, uh, yes, we know that makes a difference. So even coming back to more traditional, but the, the co-created uh, innovation programs that we have had that have, you know, pulled together actors across industries as well as government agencies has had that type of, not on an ambitious level enough, not with the right directionality towards the mission previously, uh, too much incremental, et cetera. But we have seen it actually drive. Uh, so for instance, Trafikverket, the government agency uh, with a regulatory mandate has actually adapted its way of working, has you know, been able to shorten the time and time, you know, the change how they procure solutions, how they uh, enable policy, et cetera, because of this type of common platform and this type of dialogue and this type of strategic prioritization. So that's just, um, your point Christian we know that that type of collaboration works and now what's what's exciting for us is that we have the mandate again then the task of building the next generation strategic innovation programs and we have realized that now we are all agencies involved there agree that this has to start with we need to work with missions they have to be ambitious and we're going to have to pull other actors in uh, we have academia, we have institutes, research institutes, we have a corporates, big and small, we will need civil society in, we will need the regulatory government agencies in. Uh, so I think that that mindset is there is a fantastic opportunity. How do we do it in practice? Well, uh, let's just say we just launched something that I hope can be a valuable resource. We launched something called Samverket, which are two spaces uh, in Sweden that are actively designed to have uh, public sector and, and uh, private sector have a shared physical space, uh, which is not where you sit, it's where you come uh, to do some really ambitious new things. So we have some interesting pieces, but uh, loving what I hear. But then again, you know, the, the capability and the, the tool formulation, I think is also really important. Uh, and also I, one thing we didn't talk about now, but that's also, we have to have a different way of talking and thinking from a government perspective on um, effect measurement expectations on how you know indicators <laughs> so we need a different paradigm in order for this kind of experimentation to happen and that's somewhere where i hope this community can help each other out i i, I get me i'm i'm sure yes has another question but i just want to comment quickly on that i, I, I very much like it and and i'm excited by by some bucket as well uh, i think one one different kind of thinking uh, I very much agree on, you know, what are the measurements? How do you trace um, um, progress in mission work? Uh, how do you understand whether you're getting closer to uh, the outcome you're looking for? But how do you also define outcomes in an ambitious way that is not locked in, but actually opens up opportunity? Uh, because missions really are about generating new opportunities and new value rather than hitting a very, very specific target in my, in my mind, actually. Um, but I think there's another one, which is the traditionally in government, we thought about when we procure or when we even um, come with innovation funding, it has to be competitive. And I think missions actually challenge that notion that you want a, 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 a red hot competition between great, great researchers that struggle to the death and then somebody wins and then everybody else is out. Mm -hmm. What you want with missions is actually the opposite. You want to crowd in the best ones. Uh, you, you don't want to get the, the bad ones, but you want to do it differently, right? You do want to do it collaboratively and you want to do it in, in crowding in knowledge and insight and make it a joint effort. Uh, because So it's not about a uh, competition, actually, but about collaboration. Yep, absolutely. Can I just uh, also highlight another thing? Um, uh, Gothenburg University had a strategic initiative called You Got Challenges. 
uh, and they did some really interesting experiences in, in uh, and it could be compared also to missions work, but they, it was truly transdisciplinary in their approach. Uh, and I think that uh, I'm looking forward to learn more about the hows in, in how they did it, but um, some of those initiatives have, have been quite interesting to look at. And follow. Great. Thank you, um, and uh, really inspiring uh, insights that you're, you're sharing around this. I, I mean, maybe just to pick up on uh, a question from uh, Gaston, uh, or, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm probably mentioning, not pronouncing your, your name correctly, Gaston, but but you, you were sort of saying how to land missions beyond institutional speech, and it made, made me think about, um, I'm not gonna mention who in, in the country, but, but I've certainly seen a few times now uh, uh, agencies uh, and innovation agencies kind of just uh, change the language uh, to um, to for whatever they usually do and now just call missions instead of uh, policies or instead of uh, competitions or, or, or whatever the, the, they were doing before uh, whereas the infrastructure on the on the back end is, is, uh, is very much more, more or less the same this is obviously in a way risking giving missions a bad name um, uh, we were sort of touching on this in the conversation earlier uh, I guess there was a risk of getting, well, on the one hand, you need to get going. So obviously it's good that people are trying, but then on the other hand, if you need to get going in a way where you don't bring the, the sort of the, so the power holders or the decision makers along, where they actually kind of, let's say, meet the design intent and the integrity of the approach, uh, and they learn by doing the approach in a, in a let's say, a proper way. Um, uh, yeah, there was a bit of a, dilemma or a bit of a challenge there. So how do you bring the decision makers along in a good way uh, to take ownership of this and, 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 and so on? Uh, while at the same time, you need to get going, you actually need the initiative uh, and sometimes even yesterday, right? So, so how do you see that? Um, I, I uh, again, reflecting on our session we had at the DDC yesterday that I think one of the things I said was that maybe we don't always want there may be decision makers we don't want in the journey. And I'm simply saying that because this is a question, as you said, Daya, about mindset. And, and not everyone has necessarily the mindset that will help. And so I think there has to be uh, a sense of, um, of urgency where you actually get started. Uh, as I think uh, I, I, I'm, I'm quoting Dan now, perhaps, but I think this, you know, start by starting. You simply get going. And then you see who joins and you invite in and you are open, you're transparent, you're collaborative. And then I, I think you will quickly you know, find out who in the ecosystem, who, who in the problem domain will actually want to join, are curious, want to share, want to take part, and, and who, who, who does not. I'm not saying that there not, can't be ecosystem actors that are so critical to the mission that you somehow have to get them on board. But, but I actually think that it's, you know, someone has to start the journey. And clearly it's easier if you have funding available, but even if you have, don't have much funding, which, which we don't, I think you can still take some first steps and then appeal to people's uh, uh, imagination around what's actually possible. And then to begin that, uh, build that momentum. Uh, yeah, and I agree. And I think that uh, once you start going also just mapping out. So th there are often actors that are ambitious and uh, you know that are willing to help. It's just uh, instead of thinking which decision makers you want, I, I believe very much in what you're saying, just get started and then start mapping who is already also running in this direction. Uh, and uh, again, coming back to COP. So um, I'm just looking at circularity. So I'll give you one example. There's a company in Sweden who, who used to work with or they work with waste management. So they've been lowest in the food chain. <laughs> Please, uh, you know, reduce waste, etc. And now they are the ones with the most skills, knowledge, actively driving circularity, using this as a resource. And they are the ones understanding what what we need to change in in policy, etc. And and you know, as soon as there's a context, uh, the space itself creates opportunities for for that engagement to kind of blossom. So I agree with Christian. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, we are almost out of time. This is, this is a bit of a quick conversation. So obviously to be hopefully continued in, in many different ways uh, as we go forward. Uh, but since this is the, the end of the, the end of this uh, learning journey, temporary learning journey uh, for this community, um, I, I wanted to just ask you basically for your, for your immediate advice uh, that you want to give to, to, the, to, the, to the public innovation practitioners, both on this call and and, and beyond, uh, particularly around what, what do you think uh, is the most important thing? So if you are a, 
either innovator in government or someone working to support government uh, or institutional transitions and, and so on um, that are, you know, in, in one way or another, maybe if not stuck, then certainly sort of searching for things to do or, or places to start in, in getting this going. What would be your, your sort of one advice to, to that person? No, it's not an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I'm here to learn, so I want to listen to all of you. I, I, one, I want to say three things, I think. Um, one, there's a lot of hope in the fact that winds have changed. Uh, I don't think it's the same situation as just a few years ago. It's less about standing on the barricades, convincing. It's more about actively just working with all of them. And then there are many now who, who share a real uh, sense of urgency and willingness to, to try out new ways of working together. And there's a real demand for this now. So that's one thing. So just feel that and know it. Uh, the other one, I guess, is just, uh, so work in practice gets started, but at the same time, I think thinking about the scalability of things, that's why I think, you know, if we would have had an EU wide uh, policy sandbox tool, rather than dive into one policy at the time, for instance, these kind of toolkits, that's what I would, for also like where how do we more effectively also identify the things that can really help things scale um right and um maybe three kinds of uh, three points of uh, advice I, I think first and foremost um if you want to to um to get going i, I think uh, you know what what problem do you care about uh, what 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 problem is worth solving uh, from your vantage point, either as an individual or as, a, as an institution? I think the other one is to to begin to um, be really curious about mission methodology and how this is emerging. And again, not, not one size fits all, but I think it's worth diving into the the the, the, the logic and the and the thinking behind it because I think it's it is. I mean, uh, to answer the whole question of this uh, session. No, missions are not the answer to everything, but uh, I think missions are a, a pretty good bet in a direction we need to go in to solve some of the biggest problems we've got. And then finally, of course, you'd, as you'd expect me to say, um, it, it might be useful, at least uh, speaking of transdisciplinary, uh, to also draw in on, uh, on design approaches and design methodology as you, as you go ahead with that. Uh, I, I see the, the leading institutions around the world that are making progress on missions all in one way or the other, and I'm looking at Daya, uh, also drawing in design. Uh, so with that plug, thank you, Christian and uh, Daria. Uh, no, uh, this was really, truly a, a thought-provoking, quick conversation, but still with so much depth and, and insight. So I really appreciate you taking the time to, to share that with us. Um, and I want to take this opportunity, since this is the last session, to say thank you on behalf of uh, all of the State of Change crew and, and uh, the fellows that's been involved. Uh, thank you, James, for uh, holding the fort uh, throughout uh, this, these three days. Um, and this thank you for everyone uh, for uh, taking part and contributing. Um, all of these sessions have been as lively in the chat, uh, and people are so generous with, with what they share and what they, what they offer as, as, as recommendations and, and, and so on. So that's the spirit, I think, uh, speaking of missions and how uh, what's needed, I think that sort of spirit, uh, that, that very... Uh, radical generosity is, is, is what I think can also help uh, this movement come along. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, for now, Christian, Daria, thanks so much and uh, please keep in touch and, uh, and just looking forward to uh, whatever comes next on, on, on your work agendas. Um, and uh, to the rest of you, take care and, and thank you.